I have more or less been pondering a switch from Canon, which I switched actually from Nikon in order to shoot with uh, Canon's first mirrorless offering way back with the R. I switched from almost a decade of shooting Nikon DSLRs to Canon and I've been very happy ever since. Of course, I've been keeping up with Sony bodies as they come out and uh, just this year with the release of the Nikon Z9, I started keeping up with uh, what Nikon had to offer. When Nikon released the Z9, uh, it was clear to me that they completely overhauled the autofocus system to be as good, if not better than most of their competitors. Finally, because all of the Nikon mirrorless cameras before that, no matter what anybody wants to tell you, you, the autofocus was completely subpar and unacceptable, uh, especially if you're trying to do professional work. But that all changed with the Nikon Z9, later the Nikon Z8, and now finally the Nikon ZF. I was actually ready to review this camera about a month ago uh, when just on a random whim, I decided to buy a mount adapter. This company called TechArt makes all kinds of various adapters, uh, both for Nikon, Sony, and I think even Fuji, a bunch of other camera brands. And I decided to pick up two versions. One is the Canon EF to Z mount adapter. So this takes the older EF mount from older Canon lenses, like this big old 50 1.0 and continues to enable autofocus just the way a normal Z mount lens would work. And then the other adapter I purchased is this, the TZM02. It's actually a little smaller than you might think if I don't have the lens attached. This review isn't gonna be about these adapters specifically, other than to say this adapter takes any lens that's an M mount, so the Leica mount standard, uh, which is typically a manual focus lens, and adapts it to the Z mount while enabling autofocus. There's actually an autofocus motor in this mount adapter. Now that's not totally uncommon. In fact, TechArt and other companies have made autofocus adapters for Sony E-mount uh, for a while now, but they were always pretty crappy. <laughs> Uh, I have a feeling there's something um, unique to the Z-mount that TechArt is able to leverage, uh, enabling autofocus on what are otherwise completely manual focus lenses in a way that is incredibly impressive. I'm gonna do a few demos using this AF-mount adapter, starting with this 58 1.2, which was originally released in 1977. Very old, beautiful lens that uh, inspired a whole slew of other Nikon lenses, including the 58 1.4G and the 50 1.2, which most people are familiar with those, this is the 58 1.2 Noct. It's a very beautiful lens. But what's incredible is that most lenses that are manual focus uh, can be adapted to shoot to M mount body. So I can mount this to a Leica camera. But what's cool is you can stack the adapters. So I can do an F to M mount adapter on this lens and then mount that to the, to the M to Z mount, thus enabling autofocus on an old Nikon lens back to a Nikon body, which is pretty incredible. Of course, Nikon's got their own mount adapter and it works really, really well. And this is just from F to Z. And unfortunately, it doesn't do anything related to autofocus. So, so if your lens has autofocus, it will continue to work. If it doesn't, it definitely won't work. So that's where the tech art system is really compelling. Now, one of the big shortcomings about the ZF is the, the shallow body. And if you've researched this at all, you've probably come across the brand Small Grip that makes a gripped um, extension that I really, really love. I also bought a more expensive and prettier, I believe the company is called I Wooden Grip, something like that. And though it adds uh, this really, really nice kind of vibe, I, I will say because of the nature of it being wood, I think, and maybe it's just the time of year where the weather and humidity is changing rapidly. It does have a little bit of a flex and bend to it, even though it's really tightly secured, which I found very distracting. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm just using uh, too heavy uh, lenses or something. And just throughout an entire, you know, really busy, intense wedding day, it started to, every time I, I picked it up, I'd feel this tiny little give and it irked me every time. So uh, I think I probably won't use this grip as much. The small rig grip is, is more than good enough. Uh, it's not quite as big, but it feels totally solid and it feels totally native to the to the camera body itself and its design and materials and everything else. Speaking of the design, obviously this is a very unique camera in terms of its retro vibe. Uh, and it's unfortunate because though these buttons on top look really, really cool, you can control um, ISO and shutter. It's not a feature I use at all. I basically just put these into one third step and C mode and use the traditional thumb and index finger uh, wheels uh, 
to adjust aperture and shutter. Uh, for ISO, I have my front button set, so what, as I'm shooting, I can just hold that in and toggle auto ISO on and off or just adjust the ISO manually. So it's unfortunate that you can't customize these buttons to do anything else other than just put them in sort of a default mode where just the other buttons work as intended. In fact, that's one of my only complaints about this body is, is that there's not one more customizable button somewhere on here. If you want a TLDR, I kind of gave away, obviously, my conclusion with this review, and that's that this camera is so nice, I bought it twice. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if it's gonna completely take over my Canon R3 body, uh, because that one has a built-in grip, and it's super lightweight, and I'm not that unhappy with the R3 for any particular reason. But as a professional photographer, if I am gonna switch to any other camera system, I'm gonna have identical bodies, so I never have to do that mental trade-off and calculation of what body I'm choosing and why and when. I want the exact same baseline starting point for everything that I do. Before we jump into looking at some of the photos, I just wanna do a quick uh, autofocus demonstration. So I'm just recording the HDMI output of the screen with a Z mount, uh, the 50 F 2.0 that this comes with. Fine lens, I'm not gonna review it here. Some people say it's soft, I haven't noticed that at all. Um, I mean, just looking right now on the back of the screen, it seems pretty, pretty sharp to me. I'm gonna set up one of these little mannequin guys and just try and do, you know, an unscientific but practical demo of exactly how fast this autofocus is, is. So I'm gonna put my focus point on the background behind me and then focus to the front. Snapped pretty quickly, back behind, back to front. Pretty good, behind, front, behind, front. Okay, and then panning left to right, up and down, it is really sticking to that little mannequin, no problem. So I'm gonna switch away from this lens, not to a 40, but to a 50 f 1.0. Now this is a lens that Canon released uh, I think in the early 90s, maybe the 80s, and it ended up being uh, something they had to discontinue. Because it was a 50 f 1.0 with an incredibly shallow depth of field, it did not sell well back in the DSLR days. Combined with the autofocus systems of Canon in that era, it just could never do well enough that people, I don't know, it just didn't sell and they discontinued it. Uh, but in this new age of mirrorless motors, you get the benefit of new autofocus and kind of the tracking technology and software applied to these uh, older motors. So I'm gonna focus all the way in the background, foreground, background. So this is probably one of the most difficult lenses with autofocus in existence for any camera to handle. Again, it's 50 millimeter f 1.0. So it takes, and it takes kind of a while for it to track the entire, uh, you know, closest distance possible versus furthest, you know, infinity distance. And it actually even has a button here so you can limit the range that it tries to rack focus if you need. But it's really smooth and pretty reliable and it continues to track this subject. Let's try it on the face, just like the other lens does in terms of how quickly I move the camera around. It's, it's still got very, very sticky autofocus. It's just a little slow tracking from the very, very kind of infinity range to as close as you're gonna get range. But that's uh, pretty smooth and reliable. Again, this is probably one of the most difficult lenses I could have mounted to this right now. Next, I wanna try the adapted old Sigma 51.4. This is the pre-art series and a lens that I used uh, for years as I was getting started in my photography career. So it's a 51.0 and it is snappy and fast. You can see just how quickly from back to front, from back to front. It's very, very snappy and fast, uh, especially compared to that 51.2, but both are pretty much just as reliable in terms of the stickiness of once it's acquired autofocus uh, and it's sort of in the range of where it needs to be, uh, sticking to it. So that's an F mount adapted to uh, the Z mount. Now that we've kind of set somewhat of a standard, I know it's tough to tell just from watching a video, but now that we've set somewhat of a standard in terms of what autofocus speed and reliability might look like, let's play around with the Noctilux. So this is a 50.95 manual focus only lens that's gonna now have autofocus enabled through the magic of this TechArt adapter. Front focus, rear focus. Front focus, rear focus. F front to rear. Now, it does hunt a little bit when it gets uh, pretty much like close and, and in the range of what your subject needs to be, but it's it's pretty subtle. It's not too distracting and it just it kind of just takes an extra little uh, step to make sure what it's on is is actually fully acquired. But the oscillation between going as far back or so as possible up to the the front um, is very very snappy. I would say it's almost if not just as fast as the native uh, F to Z mount adapter enables, which is pretty mind-blowing. So, there is a small catch with this. Because you still have manual focus 
focus control over this lens. You want to keep it set at infinity pretty much uh, for, for most of the time. Otherwise, uh, if it's not set to infinity, you won't be able to focus um, you know, beyond a certain distance. So for example, if I move this to 3.3 feet, which is the closest focus range, um, I'll be able to focus on anything really, really close like that, but as soon as I try and focus on anything further away than 3.3 feet, it can't acquire autofocus. So there's an extra little bit of mental calculus you need to do um, if you're focusing within a certain range, but for the most part, I just leave it at infinity and then let autofocus uh, do its thing from there. Now, one extra benefit of using this system, I haven't measured it, but I'm certainly able to focus way closer than 3.3 feet, which has normally been a, a complaint and a limitation of using the 50.95. 3.3 feet is kind of a far distance uh, to be able to do that. And just to my eye here, I'm probably able to focus um, at about a foot and a half. Uh, as my maximum close focus. And this lens is absolutely beautiful. One thing I've been thinking about though, and I've heard from people that have used this adapter on Sony, is that uh, the motor in this adapter could kind of start to fail. And I have a feeling that has to do with the weight of the lenses that are being mounted on here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and mount the 35 1.4 Voigtlander, which is a featherweight lens. It weighs absolutely nothing. Not only do I think that I don't have to worry about weight issues affecting the motor at all, but the autofocus seems to be just a little bit faster and snappier with this lens. I think in large part, that's because this is not as heavy a lens for this mount AF motor to have to move. These are all just things to keep in mind. Uh, as far as the autofocus system goes, uh, it works, I haven't seen any limitations in what focus mode you can use or not. With Sony, that's not the case. You are limited to, I think, just using an AFS type of mode. Um, and I'll also mention that I got a chance to test this mount adapter on a Sony in Poland a couple weeks ago, and I used a 50 millimeter uh, Leica, the 51.4, and it was fine, but it did seem to hesitate and be a bit slower than uh, the mount adapter to the Z mount. Obviously, it's kind of amazing that with this camera setup, you can use such a range of lenses from Nikon's own old lenses to Canon's EF lenses to Leica. Um, and even this, this is a 51.2 lens that I had mounted on this really old um, camera. I just bought it at a, you know, a vintage shop years ago. It's just been hanging on my wall. I was able to get a threaded mount adapter for this to mount to M. And now even this random, old 51.2 from God knows how long ago can autofocus with this camera setup. Uh, obviously it's really soft and dreamy, but, but it's kind of amazing that I'm able to sit here and be demoing this for you right now. There's one other lens I wanna show you the look of, and it's a crazy one. This is actually a 50 millimeter F0.75. And this is a lens that I bought very randomly <laughs> Uh, on the internet somewhere, a couple hundred bucks maybe. And it doesn't have any ability to change focus, but you can actually use this through the autofocus adapter. You only have a really, you only have a really small range of what can be in focus. So like, so I, it can go about as far back as, let's see, this router that's back here and about as close as that mannequin from here. But this is kind of insane. This really large, unique, very, very niche 50.075 lens can have autofocus enabled through the TechArt adapter on the Z-mount. Of course, it's a little bit wonky given the range of what could possibly be in focus on this lens, but the performance is still very snappy and quick. I'm actually pretty impressed. Uh, I've never actually even used this lens for a portrait yet because, because it was just kind of a novelty thing I bought that I could never really do anything with. But I think we can all admit it looks pretty freaking cool on the front of this camera. And that leads me into my next point. Uh, the, the, the experience and ergonomics and just overall attitude that I have when I'm shooting with this camera is nothing short of insanely fun. It blows my mind that other camera manufacturers haven't uh, also taken time to release something in this look, with this look and styling. Nikon also did this back with their DSLR range with the DF, and that also was a very, very fun camera, but they, they gave it artificial constraints with how you could uh, use the field of view, like the, basically the aperture preview relative to the exposure preview. You had to hold a button the entire time to do that, and just stuff that made no real sense other than it seemed like maybe they were worried about cannibalizing their own sales. With this camera, it doesn't seem like Nikon has been worried about that at all. Uh, it's got obviously the same autofocus motor that's in the Z8, the Z9, and it's got the sensor from the Z6 II, I believe. Um, and one thing that's a huge bonus for that is that you have the mechanical shutter, which I really struggled with when I was uh, testing the Z9 and the Z8. I, those, those cameras, you only get the option of completely silent shooting or shooting with a little bit of a sound effect that I just 
didn't find appealing at all. The sound of the shutter is really nice. It's not too annoying. You can still shoot in silent mode. Uh, it's definitely more susceptible to banding and shutter roll in that mode than the Z8 or Z9, but I almost never really use it. The natural mechanical shutter sounds really appealing and just fine to me. Three other points I'll talk about with the build quality. One is related to battery life and it's perfectly acceptable. I wanna say about 2000, maybe 25 um, frames per, per battery charge, totally in line with what I would expect from other cameras. Two, this is the first Nikon uh, mirrorless camera that has a flip out screen that works in this orientation where you can go full selfie mode and pan up and down. And that's something I've become very convinced by and used to. Um, it's just the way I love to shoot now. If I'm not using the eye viewfinder, I love just flipping out the screen this way so I can shoot from the waist much easier than the way the other Nikon screens pivot. Uh, this is wonderful. And I hope Nikon moves this into all their other camera bodies as well. I'm still waiting on a manufacturer to do some kind of low res screen on this side too so that I could flip, let the person see themselves that I'm photographing while also seeing it in the back of my camera somehow. That would be really, really nice. It's just a random feature if you're doing just portraits or headshots or something like that. And the last thing I'll mention is the overall feel. Uh, the actual build quality is super solid. It feels almost like everything's made of metal. I don't think that it is, but it certainly has that effect. Again, Nikon certainly added some things that uh, look cool but are unnecessary, like these top buttons. There's a cool black and white mode that you can just switch into shooting black and white all the time. And then there's this tiny, tiny little screen on top that all it does is show you your aperture setting, which is just totally silly. I would much have preferred that to show battery life or something a little more relevant to what I'd be using every day. So I wanna jump into Lightroom just to review some photos. Like I said, earlier this year, I started using the Z9, uh, segued into the Z8 and now the ZF. And one thing that's really interesting is that the sensor in this is from the earlier kind of era of Nikon's mirrorless cameras. Uh, so what I wanna do is just a quick sort of review across the high ISO range to start with between the ZF, the Z9, and the Z8. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, select all three of those, sort by ISO, sort by ISO speed, and see some of the, the higher end ranges that I was shooting. Okay, this appears to be 12,800 with the Nikon Z8. And there's a lot of grain here. Uh, for 12,800, that is a lot of grain. Um, it's probably usable as a black and white or something like that. Uh, but where you can see grain kind of hit the worst is, is especially in the, like the lower sort of shadow areas. Okay, let's go toward the, the upper register of where I might ever shoot with some of my Canon stuff, which is about 25,600. So I've got 22 images from the Nikon Z8 uh, with this. This is from a trip to Iceland and you can see it's very, very noisy um, and, and bandy. Uh, you can probably use the uh, new AI noise reduction filter to clean some of that up, but it's pretty bad. You can see here, it's just full of banding both because of the electronic shutter I was using and the overall quality of the sensor. Just 25,600 is a lot for this to keep up with. Um, you know, again, it's still recoverable and usable. Okay, so 6400 with the Nikon Z9. Looks very, very clean to me. With the Nikon Z8, it's got some noise there. And the Nikon ZF, uh, doesn't look like it has nearly as much noise to me. I mean, it's noisy, but I think that that's pretty comparable to the noise that I'm seeing if not much cleaner than the noise that I'm seeing with the Nikon Z8. Of course, these are totally unscientific. Let's just stick with the Nikon uh, Z8 and ZF because in theory, because uh, in theory they're the same sensor. Nikon has said it's the exact same physical identical sensor in the Z8 as the Z9. Uh, the ZF has a different one. I still have a theory that the Z9 and Z8 have slightly different colors. I think they're made more or less tuned differently. Uh, that's only because uh, anecdotally, I had m a much easier time editing uh, my Z9 files than I did my Z8 files. But I had a lot more time and experience shooting the Z8 uh, than the Z9. Uh, let's jump into the higher register of ISO ranges again. Um, just to look at it, I don't have a comparable one at 40,000 ISO with the Z8, but this is the ZF and 40,000 ISO is pretty extreme. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove my preset on it just to, get it as clean as possible. Yeah, the range of what's recoverable there is, is very impressive in my opinion. Here's an example of 25,600 ISO with the Nikon Z8. Um, it's a little overexposed for the shot maybe. I'm gonna take off my preset actually and just look at it sort of straight out of camera, uh, looking at the, the 
darkest parts of the frame, which is in this uh, black hoodie that kind of has a weird texture and makes it hard to tell. Uh, but you can just appreciate the, the amount of noise there. Not a lot of color noise, it does great. But here's the ZF at the exact same, at the exact same ISO. And that looks more or less the same to me in terms of maybe there's a little bit more color noise in here, but, but both I would say uh, fairly impressive for 25,600. Here's another one, uh, the Z8 at 22,800. Uh, and it's very, very noisy and grainy, also with some color banding, especially in her hair here. Um, here is the ZF, same exact ISO rating at night. And I just wanna say that looks cleaner to me. Like for sure that looks cleaner. Especially in the darkest of areas. I don't think I have any others with the Z8 at that exact range. Let's check this one. Here's a Z8 at 20,000 ISO. Some food being cooked. It looks pretty good. You know, I gotta say, uh, so this is the ZF at 20,000 ISO. And I gotta say, that noise looks way cleaner to me. Let's take a look at this one again. Zoom in. Same sensor settings, everything else. This is just black darkness I'm zooming into, which is more or less the same as what is occurring here. Uh, I would say that is quite an obvious difference in quality. Um, now, of course, you're getting a lot more megapixels out of the out of the Z8, you're getting about 8,256 8, on the long edge uh, versus the ZF being only 6,000, but that is still way more uh, than I would ever really need for anything. And then let's pop over here to just 4,000 ISO, which should be pretty clean for both these cameras at this range. That is actually still a bit noisy in my opinion, but uh, let's jump over to the ZF in low light at, again, 4,000 ISO. I gotta say, I think it's cleaner. So this is an interesting thing to call out, in my opinion, is that the ZF sensor appears to have way less noise uh, than the Z8 sensor. And I would have to assume then by comparison, the Z9 sensor. Now, it's not all about noise. Obviously, a lot of this is about dynamic range. Uh, we can jump into our really low ISO and just do a quick sort of high contrast dynamic range comparison. This looks pretty clean throughout the entire range, even in the darkest areas. I would have no problem balancing the dark shadows of that church paint against the uh, bright sun sky. Uh, but let's find something that's just the ZF at 32 ISO, at uh, ISO 50, which I think is as low as it will let you go. Okay, so here's a couple against the bright, bright sky. I don't even think I was exposing for the sky in this shot. Uh, I was certainly losing some of the detail in the sun here. Uh, you can see where it went a bit nuclear, but I'm fully able to recover most of this. It's shifting a little green, it looks like, in uh, some of the shadows. Some of that's probably the green from the grass they're standing on. But here's another uh, really high dynamic range example where, where I can rack almost this entire range with a ton of flexibility balancing the brightest parts against the uh, darkest parts. I'm gonna go ahead and say it looks comparable. Uh, definitely not seeing one sensor being completely better than the other in terms of dynamic range. And finally, I just wanna go through some of the photos I've made with this camera. At the end of the day, like spouting off specs and looking at you know plus or minus five stop ISO comparison stuff, um, can be interesting and, and helpful to some degree, but if the photos um, you're actually making, if you're just not inspired by some aspect of the camera, if the camera's not getting out of your way to a certain degree, that you can focus on the content and your reaction time and all that kind of stuff, all of those technology stats really don't matter much, in my opinion. It all has to come together in a, in a really nice balanced way. Um, and this camera absolutely does that. After spending so much time with this, uh, it definitely has an autofocus uh, system that's better than the Canon R3. Uh, I have a feeling the Canon R1 that hopefully will come out next year will leapfrog the ZF, but, but right now the R3 itself uh, is definitely not up to exactly where the ZF is or any of the other newer Nikon cameras that were released this year. And that makes sense. They were released this year. They're newer technology and Nikon has clearly put a lot of time and investment into a high quality autofocus system. Um, the overall editing of the files, I must say, has also 
has also been really nice. There's a particular warmth and just overall, no matter how much you try and match sensors or use a preset company or whatever to, to hopefully match sensors, and no matter how much Adobe themselves tries to match sensors with camera profiles, uh, there's always gonna be slight variance from one sensor to the next, and I just love Nikon's colors. I always have, I missed my all-time favorite sensor was the Nikon DF that actually wasn't even that good of a performer. The dynamic range on that was very limited, but the colors it rendered were just absolutely uh, my favorite every time. And this sensor definitely reminds me of that camera. But I have to say, so did the Nikon Z9. Uh, that's where I'm thinking the Z8 was maybe Yes, the same physical sensor, but tuned slightly different. I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, I will say uh, adding a flash to this works wonderfully, uh, but the, the lack of a longer grip or something with a battery in it to center the balance of gravity is a real problem. It's one reason why I'm not instantly completely jumping ship. I, I'm hoping maybe Nikon or someone else could possibly make uh, a battery grip that helps balance that out. Because when you throw a flash on here, even if it performs really, really well, uh, it becomes so much of a strain on your wrist and hands uh, that, you know, if you're doing that two or three hours, four hours every wedding uh, is gonna be a problem. Finally, I wanna wrap up with this. So good on Nikon at avoiding the mistake they made with the DF, which only had a single card slot, which I know a lot of people can't stand these days. Uh, so you have a micro SD and then a regular SD to write to. Uh, the problem with that is, especially with the uh, extended grip adapter, when you try and eject the SD card, it's really hard to get your fingers in there and pull it out. So you actually wanna almost like push it down and then let it go like a spring. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't fly out quite that extreme, but yeah, if you just kind of, you can get a feel for it and just let it eject very much like a spring loaded thing, sliding your finger off really quickly, it'll pop right out without having to get in there with tweezers or something or take the extended grip off uh, and then and then take it out from there, because that's just silly. I would not want to do that every time I had to eject the card. I really hope you found this review helpful. This is by far one of the most fun cameras I think I've ever shot with, and I'm just so joyful that it even exists in the world. Uh, because of the flexibility of these TechArt and Nikon mount adapters, I have to say, I would recommend this camera to pretty much anybody that has Leica M mount glass or old Canon EF mount glass or old Nikon F-mount glass. So that's a huge range of people that can actually use this camera beyond just legacy Nikon owners. I'll throw some raw files in my post on Patreon, and if you have any questions at all, you can ask me questions right there on my Patreon feed. As always, thank you so much for your attention, and I'll be back soon. Bye, everyone.